Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Adopt as your fundamental creed that you will equip yourself for life, not solely for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the whole community. Is a quote from Australian military commander and engineer Sir John Monash. Widely regarded as one of the best Allied generals in the First World War and the most famous commander in Australian history. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our guest today, someone who served in the Australian Army for 40 years, having been deployed to Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, East Timor, Malaysia, Germany, the United States and Iraq. Today, he continues to serve the community as a member of the Senate. Our guest is Senator Jim Molan, AODSC, a retired Major General of the Australian Army. As Liberal Senator for New South Wales, he is currently Deputy Chair of the Select Committee on Foreign Interference Through Social Media. During his career in the Defence Force, Senator Molan has been an infantryman, a helicopter pilot, a commander of Army units, from a 30-man platoon to a division of 15,000 soldiers. He was deployed to Iraq in 2004 during a period of continuous and intense combat as the Coalition's Chief of Operations. Following his retirement from the Australian Army in 2008, he released his first book, Running the War in Iraq. In 2013, he was appointed as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Operation Sovereign Borders. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to follow on your preferred podcast platform and share with your friends and colleagues. And for our listeners in Canada, South Korea and Indonesia, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners Executive Search and Board Advisory. Today, we are given a unique insight into the highly complex arena of national security, world geopolitics and war. With threats to national security and the world order at large, Senator Molan shares with us the opportunities present to ensure the sustainability of the relative prosperity Australia has enjoyed in decades past and the safety of generations to come. So sit back and enjoy the cost of prosperity. Senator Molan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Grace. Good to be here. Look, I'd start with an easy one with you, Jim. What as a nation should Australians be looking forward to in the next 10 years? It is very, very dependent on what happens in the next couple of years mm -hmm. because we are in the most uncertain period of time of our history since 1942. And in 1942, it was pretty uncertain, I can tell you. Not that I was there. I'm <laughs> old, but I wasn't there in 1942. But we know what was happening in 1942. We were very nearly invaded. The world was turned on its head with authoritarian nations smashing the democratic the, the, the democratic nations of the world, 80 million people died in the next few years, and the power relativities of the world were reset. So in the next 10 years, it seems to me that we face almost exactly the same thing. We are seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the reason that Australia is fat, dumb and happy, as I say appallingly, the reason that we're prosperous and secure is because of the United States. 
It's not because of fundamentally what we have done. It's because of what the United States has done. We pay our dues to the United States, and every every couple of years we dash off to some kind of war that the United States have set up. But mainly, it's the power and the influence of the United States. Uh, but that's now changed. The United States is not a shadow of its former self. And after 75 years, two countries have arisen, Russia and China, but also Iran and North Korea. A number of chi- uh, nations have arisen which have absolutely no respect for us, for what we stand for. In fact, as we stand at the moment, a, a, a liberal democracy, they see us as a threat, Greg. So what will happen to Australia in the next 10 years very much depends on how we react now to the possibility of great power shifts. For some reason, Jim, I, I do listen to what you've said. My concern is, it, is the message getting through to Joe Blow in Australia? It's, it's rarely likely to get through to Joe Blow in Australia. It didn't get through to Joe Blow in the UK in the 1920s and the 1930s until it was imminent. It didn't get through to Joe Blow in Germany in, the, in those periods of time. Yep. Does anyone think that anything approaching the truth is getting through to Joe Blow in China at the moment? So I think the realisation of the dangerous period into which we are progressing is increasing and it's increasing dramatically. And I, just one of the small manifestations of that is that in the 2009 election, when I ran below the line, yep. I received the most extraordinary number of votes, the largest number of votes of an individual politician, uh, first preference votes in Australia's political history throughout all of this federation. And that was only in New South Wales. Yeah. You know, I reckon I could get similar votes across Australia because people are concerned. Now, whether Joe Blow, whether the young people yep. are as tied up in this, uh, I mean, I, I, I would be astounded if they are. I, you know, the youngest people that I see are my, are my relatives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I travel a fair bit. Uh, I don't have much to do with soldiers nowadays, uh, young soldiers, but I certainly listen to what's going on around the world. I've got uh, relatives who are mixed up in the media. And I listen to them, uh, and uh, no, we're 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 a fairly easy come, easy go society. Uh, my fear, uh, and, and I've, I must admit that the government of which I'm very proud to be a member, the coalition government, has done more for defence than any other government that I can think of. It has been extraordinary uh, since Tony Abbott's time, through Malcolm Turnbull, through through Scott Morrison, now with people such as Melissa Price and uh, Karen Andrews, and particularly Peter Dutton. We've got people who realise the situation we're in and who are working very, very hard to uh, fix the late the, the, the late problems that we have, uh, the legacy problems that we have. But uh, uh, you, know, you can do this without the kids becoming involved. I don't mind that. As long as we have the mechanism, mechanisms in place so that when something terrible does happen, Yep. The kids don't have to start from tours. I mean, we don't expect every child in the nation to know about modern mobilisation, but the bloody government better know all about it because at some stage it's going to need to mobilise a country in a modern way in exactly the same way as the Ukraine has. And I tell you, uh, if you ask that question in the Ukraine, Greg, at the moment, yep. they would fully understand because... They mobilised. They were threatened. Their very existence is threatened. They understand uh, enormous Russian, enormous Russia sitting on one side of them, hopeless Europe on the other side. They're in the middle, almost disarmed. Since 2014, they have done an extraordinary job of rearming themselves, changing their attitude. You know, and I'll finish on this, an early president of the Ukraine said, the biggest mistake we ever made was to give the nuclear weapons back to Russia. I'm sure Poland and Belarus are exceptionally worried as well. Poland is the uh, is the hope of Europe. Poland is is a nation which understands great power politics. It's been walked over for 200 years, and I'm probably I probably overseen five to 500 years before that. It's been appallingly walked over backwards and forwards. It now has an absolutely first class military. It, 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 it makes and flies F-16 aircraft. It, 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 you know, it, it's a serious player. Uh, we look at Germany. Germany, in my view, is hopeless. 
it couldn't even sustain a brigade group of, of competent soldiers in Afghanistan. Its Navy is in a poor, poor, uh, an appalling state and its Air Force recently was reduced to only a couple of aeroplanes. Now, they, they, in that period of time, they may have come back a bit in all those areas. I hope they have. But I, I do notice that it's not just it's just not just their military, it's their leadership. Mm. I mean, we've, 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 we've now had Angela Merkel for about 150 years as a leader of Germany, and she rolled over on the Nord Stream 2 thing, and, and she fundamentally sold the country out. And that's her legacy is Nord Stream 2, which compromises Germany's independence appalling. So, no, I don't know. Uh, uh, France is confused. Britain, I thought for a while there Britain was coming back, but under, under Prime Minister Johnson, uh, I'm a bit more depressed about it. But there you are. You know, the US is hopeless. The US isn't doing us any favours at the moment. No, U US is not doing anyone any favours. It's, it's military since the end of the Cold War has, has reduced by 30 to 50 percent. That's by their own measure. Uh, because they don't measure inputs like we do. We measure inputs. We say we're, we're going to add in $270 billion more to defence. We are going to fund defence at 2% of GDP. Well, that's meaningless. Yep. Absolutely meaningless, because that doesn't say whether you can win the next war. Mm. It just says a whole bunch of money is going into defence, whereas the Americans for years have said, you know, we're capable of winning two and a half wars simultaneously. Now, of course, that they're down to uh, uh, maybe we'll win one more, one war, and we can hold in another. Well, that's a 30 to 50% decrease. Now, funny about that, because people warned them and warned them and warned them and warned them. Now they face two enemies, and they cannot. You know, this is pathetic. The reaction of Europe and America to Russia's uh, uh, pushing, uh, pushing Ukraine around is absolutely pathetic. We're going to, we're, you know, we're, we're saying to President Putin, if you if you, you invade you and Ukraine, we're not going to allow you to transfer money. Oh dear, says President Putin. That's going to be the last thing that he worries about. Yeah. So, what's your thoughts on NATO then? Is it is it is it an effective body now? Has it really lost its way? After the fall of the Soviet Union, it, it lost its way a bit, then found its way a bit. Uh, found its way by embracing the Afghan war and, and out of area operations. Mm. Stoltenberg's been very, very good. He talks a tough, a tough talk. And, uh, and I admire him considerably. It's no better than the sum of its parts. Mm. And uh, I'm not too sure about the sum of its parts. You know, we, we always go this way. It's because we are liberal democracies. Oh, we are democracies of one sort or another, and and we, we have political cycles. You know, China doesn't have a political cycle, and neither does Russia. They they just take long term plans and do them. So I, 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 we can't write uh, NATO off. You know, the Americans have put troops into uh, uh, one of the Baltic states. They put troops into into Poland. They're threatening to put more into Finland. I think it was or, or Latvia, perhaps if uh, Russia invades the Ukraine. And of course, Russia has got any variation of them invasion, invading uh, Ukraine. It might invade Ukraine in the traditional sense, take it all and occupy it. Well, that's serious business. It might only take half of it. Well, they're already in the Crimea. Yeah, it might reinforce Donbass and take yeah. down to the Crimea. That's right. So, you know, unless, unless uh, Germany's speaking fairly tough at the moment, but I, I just don't see that it's got much that it can actually do. So, you know, Belarus is a, is a client state of Russia. Uh, Kazakhstan is a client state of Russia. Uh, and uh, China and, and Russia have an agreement that they will work together. I guess part of the fallout was uh, Afghanistan and what that signaled to the world and what it sent, sent signaled to those who wanted to be a little bit stronger to the, against the Americans. Yeah, I think at, at the end of Afghanistan was very shabby. It was very, very poor. Once we decided that it wasn't worth dying for, and, and we, we came to that conclusion that it wasn't worth dying for. That there was a far, far better way of getting out of the place. My view was that we should not have left. We didn't have to be in every province across every area. As long as we had a government in uh, Kabul and as long as we had one or two major bases with a bit of American leadership, then we could have avoided everything that's happened. And what has happened is appalling. Not only have we put the, uh, if we lost every gain that we made in Afghanistan, 
but we've put the Afghan people through sheer hell and we've lost all our credibility around the world. You know, the US, the US was, was clumsy in every aspect. Uh, the, the US military, of course, did their normal, very, very good job, but they were handed, you know, a, a disaster. We leapt in there and did what we could do and we did it very professionally. And, you know, our foreign minister, defence minister, immigration minister, prime minister did very, very well on that. But we lost the war. How many wars have we won since 1945? Strangely enough, I cannot think of one. <laughs> East Timor wasn't a war. Absolutely. Sri Lanka kept on losing its own insurgency whilst bumbling European nations tried to bring human rights and intercession into their war, which extended the war for year after year after year. And finally, Sri Lanka had enough brains to boot us all out, get in there, win the bloody war, and settle down and make their people happy and rich. So what do you reckon is going to happen in regards to ISIS? Because I, I hear and uh, regularly now they're, on the, they're, they're building again and they're building up in North Africa and doing that well. They'll, they'll stick their heads up. And, and I, I, don't, I don't see it as a big problem, Greg. They'll stick their heads up and we'll smash them down. If they hurt us, they will smash them down even more. Yeah, but is that going to be a response, Jim, or are we going to be proactive in managing that? I think that's going to have to be the response. Like was the intention with Afghanistan. You know, the intention with Afghanistan was that we, we leap in there, smash them up a bit, remove their capability to hurt us and go home. Well, it didn't quite work like that. Iraq was also the same. Uh, Iraq, we were going to go in there. We, some, some people believed what the emigres from Iraq were saying, that we'd be, we'll be welcomed, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we weren't welcomed, and, and uh, uh, it took a long time to stabilise the country. We stabilised it by 2011. Yeah, but we did a pretty sloppy job by, by how we structured the parliament and who we put in. Oh, yeah, and, and uh, it was very interesting. I was there when we introduced their form of democracy, uh, and that form of democracy has been modified since, but it's fundamentally uh, an Islamic form of democracy. Call it democracy if you want. Yeah, people vote. We did our best there, and our best was damn sight better than in Afghanistan. Uh, but that's their country. It's an Islamic. It's an Islamic country, and uh, uh, we ought to be happy with what we've got there. All right. So you've been talking for some time, Jim, about having a senior individual, an advisor, a, as a security advisor, or setting that up a little bit more seriously for this for this country. Are you winning your debate? Well, the government is doing much better than it, than it has done in the past. Uh, how much of that is due to me is, is the answer to that is probably not much. I am continually encouraged by my colleagues to do more. And I believe that I have an absolutely unique role in the parliament yep. and in the government because I, I've seen it and I've done it uh, and I have an understanding of war. Hmm. Uh, probably as great an understanding of war as any other Australian, probably more, Absolutely. certainly more, a greater understanding of war than, than, than anyone else in the parliament. And uh, yeah, I, I'm the chair of the defence subcommittee and that's not the be all and end all. Uh, I, I write, I uh, annoy the prime minister by asking him things. And uh, what's really a problem is that given how far behind we were, we have come a million miles. Is that fast enough, Jim? And is it? Are we thinking further enough? It's it's not fast enough at all. We've had a military now for seventy five years, which has been a, a toothless tiger, a one shot military. It's 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 not been lethal enough. That is, it can't fight hard enough. It's not sustainable enough. It can't fight for long enough, and it's it doesn't have the mass. It's not big enough. Now we've been able to get away with that for seventy five years because suppose the Americans said. Okay, you Aussies, come to Korea. Well, uh, we send a battalion across to Korea and that battalion is full of good soldiers, uh, but we don't have to actually win. We just have to participate in the war. You know, can you guys come to, uh, come to Vietnam? Okay, we went into Vietnam, we took over a province. We were offered a very, very nasty province up the north. We preferred a much more uh, pleasant province down the south, so we took that over and we, uh, we did a very good job. But of course, we lost that war and uh, we left before we lost that war. 500 Australians, 500 plus Australians paid for that with their lives and many more with physical and mental wounds. In Iraq, 
it took us about four or five, if not six months, to prepare our armoured vehicles to go to the invasion of Iraq in the first Gulf War, and which, which just illustrates that, that what we've got was at that stage not prepared for war. You know, most of our aircraft didn't have radar warners, warnings on them. Our ships at, the, at a certain stage were fitted for guided missiles, but not fitted with guided missiles. So I, I acknowledge that we have come a long, long, long way. We are much, much better. And it's, up, it's this government, no other government, it's this government from Abbott, from Turnbull, from Morrison, and the ministers that work with him that have done it, and, and I, I will always acknowledge that. The question that, that we as a government have got to address is what is the nature of a war that we might find ourselves in in the future and how do we prepare for that war? I'm, I'm past this bullshit that says we should prepare for a general war. No, we're past that now. We, we know who the enemy is. We may not know the specifics of it, but we know who the enemy is and it's time that we took defence seriously. Okay, so there are people in defence. You've made the move from defence into government. So where's the fall down, Jim? Because you know, if I'm a taxpayer, which I am, I'm getting a bit tired of spending a lot of money for defence. If you're telling me up front, which most of us know, we read about it daily, that what we're buying and purchasing, which takes forever and it's an enormous investment, doesn't stack up to what the model looks like for the future. The money that we've put into defence over the last 75 years has brought us the greatest amount of prosperity and security that God ever put breath into because we never had to fight for our existence. Yeah, but if, it's, if the enemy turned up, we weren't going to last too long, were we? But the enemy wasn't going to turn up because the Godams, the Americans, controlled all the sea lines of communications. They were overwhelmingly powerful and they were our best friends. So the, the enemy was not going to turn up on our shore okay. uh, and we paid our dues to that by, uh, uh, by fighting in their little war. Because we didn't have to look after our own security or our, def our prosperity, we embraced globalization to an extent that, all, that no one else in the world has embraced. So we sold everything overseas. Uh, all our industries went overseas just about, and we bought it back at a much cheaper place, a, a rate, and we got richer and richer and richer. Well, nowadays that's changed. So Jim, calling a spade a spade, are the Americans gonna turn up? based on the current alliance and the arrangement? And if they are going to turn up, are they going to turn up on time? Well, you are, you're, you're assuming a certain kind of war. I am. That's, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking old-fashioned war, aren't I? Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. It, it's just, just one of the many variations of war. What you just said then implies that someone's attacking Australia and America comes and helps us. Okay, that's fantastic. I don't think that's the war we're going to face. I think the war we're going to face is a massive war between China and the United States, which in the first instance, we are uh, collateral damage. That war will probably be won by China who will force America out of the Western Pacific. And we will have to sit down here at the bottom of the Western Pacific and wonder what, will, what, what our fate is going to be when China, I don't think China's then gonna in, in, invade us, why would they? Uh, they will prepare for whatever whatever America might be able to then do. What what they'd be silly not to say would be would be Australia. Did you remember those uh, those fourteen conditions we spoke to you about some time ago? We'd like you to implement that, please. And we'd also like to buy all your iron ore and all your coal at fifty bucks a ton. And so we lose our independence. That's the kind of war that I think we should be preparing for. And. See, China can do that fundamentally in one single night. China can force the Americans out of the Western Pacific by attacking South Korea, Japan, Guam, and Diego Garcia, and maybe Darwin. And they can do it with their missiles. They've put so much money into missiles. It just so happens, Greg, I've written, written a book about that, which is just about to be published. I, I heard Strange that. as it may seem. <laughs> okay, well, we're in, we're part of that book, how do we defend ourselves then, Jim? Uh, well, we've got we to figure out the nature of the war, and then we can defend ourselves. Yeah, but can we? Of course we can. Of course we can. If you take, if you take uh, the state of Israel, eight million strong, six million Jews, two million Arabs, hundreds of millions of external Arabs, they've been at war since uh, 1948. 
and they have consistently won war after war after war after war. Why? Because they were serious. And nowadays, of course, they are cutting their military back severely because uh, the Middle East, that part of the Middle East around them, has come to some degree of sense about the existence of Israel. If, if, if we don't want to defend ourselves, what's the alternative? The alternative is to become uh, a dependence of China. Now, I don't, I don't want that to happen. I don't want my life, which started in 1950, I don't want my life to be the best period of time that Australia ever had and that we end up, you know, being walked over by enormous countries. We are fabulously wealthy with an intelligent population, 25 million. You reckon the Jews wouldn't give their right arm for 25 million people living on the island that we live on? Yeah, absolutely. If the Jews can do it, if Israel can do it in the middle of the Middle East, where some parts of their areas, you know, their strategic depth is only a about three or four kilometres wide, and we can do it here. We just, just have decided that it's not what we need to do. Yeah, a different mindset too, Jim. And also look at the composition of the cabinets. Most of them form, you know, special forces, as you know, or some form of military for a period of time. Um, so a little bit different way of thinking. So we're nowhere near that. No, we're not. So what do we do, surrender? No, we don't. No. I'm not saying we surrender. But, but you're, I'm asking you, you've made the move from one side to the other. What's the debate like? The debate is... Uh, a lot of the debate is based on hope. We hope not shit, this doesn't happen. Yeah. And that's what worries me. And we've just, we've just done, the, the PM gave a mighty speech. I thought it was a fabulous speech in uh, 2020 on the 1st of June, 1st of July, which was called the Strategic Update. He gave a superb speech on that. And he put $270 billion more into defence over the next 10 years. In that speech, Part of that speech and in the strategic update was the fact that we have finally removed no threat for 10 year proviso within strategic guidance. Now that was the single that that that, that that's been in the in the in our strategic guidance for a long, long, long time. It was the single most stupid thing you could ever imagine because at no stage did anyone say, okay, well, could we prepare for something within 10 years? Suppose the poo hit the proverbial fan now, and in those days, could we be ready in 10 years' time? Well, if you look at all the programs we've got going now, Greg, we've got a submarine, which we hope to get in 20 years' time. Yeah, good luck. We've got, in, we've got military infrastructure in a 20-year program. We've got a sovereign missile building capability, uh, which is a 20-year program. And I can't think of the others, but all of a sudden now we've got a, a series of 10 or 20 year programs to make the Australian Defence Force more lethal, more sustainable, and but it doesn't make it any bigger. For some reason, we've decided we don't need to be bigger. For some reason, we have decided, Greg, that Australia has somehow stumbled onto military perfection. And we've cracked this, mate. Uh, 60 to 80,000 strong, we've cracked it. A country of 25 million people. You know, we have not done a full national security strategic assessment ever. So why haven't we, Jim? I don't know. I, I think we would be terrified. I've done it. We would be terrified uh, of what it, what it shows. I think that's the main reason. And, and uh, you know, the, the, our, our political cycle doesn't allow us to do something like this and then socialise it with the people. And then go on. Is it a vote winner, Jim? Could be. You could change it to be if I'm protecting people. I believe that the use of the term national security is a vote winner. The use of general terms is a vote winner. But uh, I don't see any tendency towards the specifics. And the specifics fairly. Uh, uh, the specifics are that we should be preparing for a war in three to five years' time. And that, that, that war should be a war between America and China. Is that what you, is that what you think, too? Oh, when I, when I go through the world literature on this, yep. of those people who say that war is possible, uh, the average is three to five years. You take out Taiwan because Taiwan, it's in Taiwan's interest to say the war will start tomorrow. But most people say three to five years. What do you reckon? Three to five years. I think it's great. Could occur, as the Prime Minister had said, in that speech he gave through misadventure, it could occur tomorrow. 
Well, if it does, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> Even if we're investing all this money in to defence, Jim, as you say, in the Air Force, the Navy, Army, um, space, etc., is it well coordinated? And is it actually linked up? And does it all make sense? Well, I think it's well coordinated for the way we've worked over the last 75 years. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, that means that in those days when there was no threat to this country and we could run every decision past government three times, uh, where we could, uh, we could uh, where, where the government was not interested in the output. See, for most of that 75 years, government was couldn't care less what we bought. They just wanted to know that that, that, that they put 2% in of GDP, or in, in the Labor Party's case, 1.6% of GDP. Yep. Now, the reason that that 2% was taken as such an, as gospel for all that period of time was because uh, that was the figure that was used for NATO when the Americans dominated the world in a single in a single great power. The Americans dominated the world, uh, and NATO, of course, being a bunch of bludgers, uh, just refused to spend the two percent that they'd agree. Mm. So that's just a general feeling. Two percent. Uh, we're past the time where two percent might be good. The PM says two percent. Two percent now. God bless him. Is a is a uh, is the bottom of how much we're going to spend. We're about 2.2% now. Uh, that may be due to the fact that the GDP has dropped a wee bit, but I wouldn't be so cynical as to say that. Yep. Uh, 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 but what we've got to do, we've got to do an analysis, a full analysis of what we need. People say to me, you know, what, what, what would you, like, Jim, like to do in defence? More submarines, more bombers, more this, more that? I say, no, let's come up with a strategy. Let's come up with a national security strategy. And as I say to people, I don't care whether we don't do it tomorrow, we don't put all the money in tomorrow, but at least once we've got a strategy, we can say to ourselves, yeah, we're doing okay. We've still got to do another 75% here or 25% there, but we're, we know what we're working for. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, 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 have, I have got a long road to go to be successful, Craig, I can tell you. But I tell you what, I have the greatest faith in Scott Morrison. I, I've worked with him for years, particularly on the borders. And here is a guy who, when he sees a problem, he can crack it. In this respect, it's just getting him to see the problem. Uh, Peter Dutton is doing a great, great job, as is Maurice Payne, uh, 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 as is Melissa Price, and also Karen Andrews. As our national security ministers, they are doing a great job. I just think they should be doing more of that great job. Yeah, okay. And, and standing back from it, Jim, maybe a little bit harsh, but you don't think they're um, they're just nodding their head? And I know you've got, you've, got, you've got a political role. Not when you put an extra $270 billion. Yeah, but it was needed no matter what, Jim, don't forget. And look what's going on in the world. We know that. But uh, why aren't they doing what you say, which is common sense? I don't think they believe that, uh, that war is as imminent as I say. Quite simple. That's what I've got to do is, you know, we have an extraordinary defence capacity in this country, but in order to re re realise that defence capacity, we've got to have started about 10 years ago. Now, the most important thing for national security in Australia yep. is the United States defence budget. No one really examines it outside of a few think tanks. Our government doesn't look at it in detail and say, bloody hell, they're not doing the right thing in the Pacific. They've now been pulled back to Europe. We, we've got to look after ourselves. You know, the time has come for Australia to pretty well look after itself. We, we would be a, a far, far better ally if we were looking after ourselves, Greg. Uh, you know, and, and, and this is a great example. The American, what they call their force posture review, uh, which is another way of saying, I don't know, it's, it's one of these chintzy words the Americans have. So, which sure enough, we'll take on board and suddenly we'll have a force posture review. But it's, it's where your forces are and what they do. Well, part of their force posture review was that they're going to put more troops in the west, northern, northern Australia, more air, air, air elements in northern Australia and more Navy elements in the north, into maybe western Australia. But the Americans are not going to send us any of their aircraft if they're going to sit on an open tarmac at Tyndall or at Richmond or at Williamtown waiting to be destroyed because they can be destroyed now. I mean, our F-35, $17 billion worth of F-35s sit happily out on the tarmac waiting for 
those Chinese missiles to come and destroy them. We have not invested in the, the infrastructure that we need to protect our own defence assets. And because, and this all of this goes back to the fact that, which is why I've written this book, which goes back to the fact that I don't believe that there is an understanding of the type of war that we face. And I certainly see it in the way ministers talk and my colleagues talk. People think that something will happen in Taiwan. We'll have a talk about it. Uh, we'll have a talk to the Americans about it. We'll arc up a few ships. We'll send the ships and the F-35s up to, up to uh, and, and the Airborne Early Warning and Control and the, and the uh, refuelers up to Japan or the Philippines or somewhere, and we'll do something. Uh, no, we won't. No, nah, it'll all be over in an afternoon. It'll all be over in a night. The Americans, the, the Chinese have the ability and the Americans admit it. The Americans admit from war game after war game after war game after war game that they lose the Taiwan scenario each and every time. Why? Because they've decided in some strange way that they're going to fight China in China's front yard. China has been looking forward to this for probably 20 years, and it's been building and building and building and building. After the first Gulf War, China saw what our air, our air power, the Western air power, could do to a, a Warsaw Pact military, and they, they, they said, well, okay, well, we won't, we won't take these uh, Westerners on in air. We'll build missiles. And so they have built, and, you know, you look at those missiles that they're firing into space, that they're going to the moon in. These are extraordinary things. Th these people can hit targets in Guam, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, Diego Garcia and Darwin with a probability of error of 5 to 10 metres. So, you know, uh, who are we kidding? If, if, we, if we don't disperse our force, at the moment we're seeing a very interesting situation in the Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing a situation where the U where the Russia has said, we're going to invade Ukraine, we're going to invade Ukraine. Everyone, everyone in the world, we're going to invade Ukraine. Here's 100,000 troops here and aeroplanes there and amphibious here and navy there. Yep. That's the greatest indicator that they that they may not invade the Ukraine. Famous last words, Greg, they'll probably cross the start line at six o'clock this evening. I don't know. What do you reckon they're doing it for then, Jim? I think they're trying something on in relation to NATO. They may in the end take military action, mm -hmm. but even the Ukraine is not fully mobilized. So the Ukraine are looking across their borders and saying, no, not yet, not yet. Now, the Israelis did this in the Yom Kippur War and got it badly wrong. They said, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Then the Syrians came. Yep. And, uh, and they just got, they just won. So it's a, a very hard game, but I don't think we'll see that with the Chinese. Why would the Chinese say, we're going to invade, you know, in six months' time, we're going to invade Taiwan? Then they arrange all their military assets in an eye-pleasing manner along the coastline and in the in the gap and waiting for the Americans to come streaming out of Korea and, and Japan and Guam and Diego and, and Darwin. Why would they do that? Why, Craig, would they not? And this is the essence of my book. So don't tell anyone this or I won't buy the book. But this is what I'm saying is that we will wake up one day and the Chinese will have removed every a bit of space capability for surveillance and communications we have. We will wake up one morning and there will be no uh, undersea cables left. Uh, we'll wake up one morning and, and before they pull the cables, they will have got into our, uh, you know, all, uh, as many places around the world, they will have got into, uh, into our, uh, uh, our cyber systems and screwed us. But we won't know much about what's going on because we won't have communications with anyone. Yep. Uh, and at the same time, uh, why would they not attack these bases? And the American military has been screaming to fortify Guam. There's three big facilities in Guam, and not one of them is fully fortified. If you're going to run a war from Guam, you've got you've to be able to disperse your assets or fortify your assets. Japan is exactly the same thing. Korea is exactly the same thing. And... You know, if, if, if China whacks those bases, which it can do tomorrow, yep. then Japan's not going to fight them. No. Japan can't fight China by itself. 
South Korea is not going to fight Japan because it's got a million nutters north of its border, all in uniform waiting to come south. That's right. Uh, and, and why wouldn't they then say to, to, to Taiwan, well, Mr. Taiwan, you know, it looks like the Americans have gone. How would you like to be a very good part of our commercial industrial setup? The Taiwanese will roll over. <laughs> then what comes next? What comes next is that, is that uh, China dominates our part of the world. You know, uh, and America, America's way of war in the past has, has been to take three years or six months in the case of the, uh, uh, the, the Gulf Wars, build up six months and then attack. Uh, in the Second World War, it took them three years to actually get the momentum going and they did brilliantly. Those days have passed. If Americans lose their air bases, but they can't replace them because guess what? The Pacific is a bloody big place. And if you've lost all your aerial tankers, no fighters are going to be able to reach China. All of this doesn't add up. And that's what I try and demonstrate in the book, that whatever is fixed in our minds doesn't add up. And this is what happened, Greg. This is what happened in 1914. This is what happened in 1939 and 1940. Are we so stupid that we're going to do this again? Yes, the answer is. Well, the signals were given well and truly before all those events happened, weren't they? No, they were. People were screaming out. And, you know, the, the strategy that existed that, that, that in, in the Second World War, that uh, the, the, the Germans would come through Belgium again, therefore the British Army and the French Army would move through Belgium, That's right. give up its defended locations, which they'd taken six months to build in the Farney War, yep. hit the roads, go forward. Well, the Germans hit them all right, but they also went through the Ardennes and tore them to bits. Yep. And, you know, look at, look, at the, look at the Japanese in the Second World War. Uh, the Japanese did not attack Pearl Harbour because they wanted to attack Pearl Harbour. They attacked Pearl Harbour in order to get the oil out of the Netherlands East Indies, That's right. which was crucial to them running their war in China and, and in, in Asia. And that's what the China, that's what China's going to do. China is not going to attack Guam and uh, Japan and Korea and uh, Diego. It's not going to attack those places as their objective. They want the, the, their objective is to get rid of the Americans out of the Western Pacific. And then say, well, by the way, Taiwan and Australia and anyone else around the place, we are top dog. Come and join us. Uh, Jim, outside of the Americans and where they're sitting now under their current leadership, are they losing allies, do you think? And is, is the Europeans backing them? Because that seems to be a bit of drift as well. Well, Germany's interesting. There's always been extraordinary anti-Americanism in Germany. And particularly since the reformation of Germany, uh, there's been very, very strong green elements, anti-war elements, and you know what we assume to be. I, I spent a, I did a posting with the British Army in Germany as a in a mechanized battalion. And I used to look at the at, at the German at the German soldiers and their beautiful equipment. This was when this was would have been late seventies, and they still had that kind of stuff from an attitude towards war. That war was important. They didn't want Russia to come screaming across their border even if it was led by East Germans, I'm not sure that they still have that attitude. France, of course, who can count on France for anything? Uh, no one can. Uh, Britain, Britain's, uh, Britain's got the smallest army it's had since, uh, since uh, Waterloo. It's just about to start another cutting. So this crap that we're hearing of Britain coming out here to play a role in the Indo-Pacific, you know, give up Britain, Get a military that's big enough. If you want to play a world role, get a military that's big enough to play a world role. So I, I'm, you know, I, I welcome them. They are great soldiers. They're great sailors. They're great airmen. They're, they're a great nation. But the whole world is in fantasy land. And I, the whole world's got to take a real big, real big look at itself and line itself up and say, what do we, what might we have to do? You know, we could do that in Australia and then we could embrace all of these countries around us if we had, and I go through what we should have to do in the book, we should be able to think for ourselves and look after ourselves. You know, we have a surprisingly good defence industry at the moment. It's not too bad. You know, it's it, from the time that I was a young soldier, it has gone ahead in, in, 
in, in leaps and bounds because governments have been investing in it. But, you know, if I say things are bad with the military, that is, it's not lethal enough, it's not sustainable enough, it not, doesn't have the mass, then the whole country is in even worse condition. The nation lacks resilience and it lacks self-reliance. Well, two questions, Jim. If you had your way, what percentage would you of GDP then, as opposed to the 2%, would you think we need to invest in defending ourselves or being prepared to defend ourselves? And the second question is, based on your intelligence or who you're still in contact with, where does President Xi sit amongst his peers now? Is he losing favoritism or is he getting stronger? I think he's getting much stronger and he's coming up for a, a conference in October of this year. He will have uh, gone through the, uh, the, the the Winter Olympics, where we'll all kowtow and say, "What a fantastic nation! What a world leader nation this is!" Uh, but just don't bring your don't bring your phones and don't protest. This annoyed me, but I'm not going to I'm not going to make an issue out of it. It annoyed me that we decided, for a range of reasons, not to send officials to the Winter. Olympics. We're on, we're only sending sixty people, but but. Uh, I think it's roughly about 60 or 80 people as, as athletes. But uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, the Uyghurs will be impressed with that. The Hong Kongers will be impressed with that. Uh, Peng Shui will be in, in, impressed with that. Uh, all two Australians that we haven't quite caught up with who've disappeared, uh, they'll be impressed with that. Anyhow, that's going to go ahead regardless of what I say. It's funny how history repeats itself. Everyone said the Germans did a great, great job in when was it thirty six that they had their Olympics, uh, and and everyone every, the, the, it was a great propaganda victory, and so will this be. Bearing what you just said there, what sort of percentage do you think of GDP should we invest in defence? I could come up with my figure, but in order to ju justify it, you need to go through a strategic assessment, a national strategic assessment. You need to you need to start with what kind of a threat we face. And it's not a threat which a 60,000 person military in a, uh, which lacks lethality, sustainability and mass in a country which lacks resilience and self-reliance. It's not whatever that costs us now, which is roughly 2%. Yeah, you're, not answering, you're not answering the question, Jim. No, I'm not answering the question because I don't have to answer the question. The question is, a, it's a pointless question. You reckon? For the simple reason that only government can answer it once, once they've conducted this assessment. Mm. And I could say, yeah, it, it, it would probably need to double. Uh, quite possibly it would need to triple. The Americans in, in Vietnam tripled theirs. Yeah. They were about 6%. Yep. And that was, just a, that was just a crappy little war on the edge of Asia. If we've got to make up time, maybe we go to 6%. Who knows? Uh, I don't. I don't subscribe to uh, the answer because the only organisation which has got all that information that can do it is the government. And have you ever seen a, a figure? Wouldn't you think that governments would say to the people, either two point two percent is military perfection, or something along those lines, uh, or two point two percent is a good start now? And we will build. And certainly, uh, it is my desperate hope that if we go into this election that's coming up, that there are two issues. The first issue is the economy, and the second issue is national security. We are the government of national security. No one touches us on on, on national security. It doesn't mean we're, we we've hit nirvana. We are also far far better on the economy. It is my hope that the, the the election will force us to come to terms with the future. So if you were to look at the benchmark against the Israelis, Jim, what, are, what do they spend in terms of uh, GDP? Oh, at various stages, they were, they were spending 8 12%. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we don't know how much more. You know, if you, if, if you, if you only pay your soldiers two and threepence a month, mm. uh, then it's very hard to figure out. We pay, we pay, we're the highest paid soldiers in the world when we go to war. So it's very hard to make these comparisons. Uh, you know, the Americans are not paid as well as we are. Uh, we get better benefits. Our veterans get better benefits. You know, we spend, we spend uh, what is it, uh, $11.5 billion per year on veterans' uh, benefits. Yeah, right. And uh, y y if we were a warlike nation that had a bunch of victories behind us, 
you could see that, but we owe our soldiers everything they get. Yep. But it'd be very nice if just every now and again we could win one. Yeah. But, Jim, just in the part of the whole strategy and the management of our natural resources, so oil, for example, gas, etc. how we're shipping that around the world, but what have we got in our supply and supporting ourselves? Are we, are we smart in how we've been managing that? Because we're certainly exposed. No, no, we're, we're totally exposed. We're totally exposed. We've contracted all our, all our, uh, our gas out uh, and, and left ourselves devoid of uh, cheap gas in this country. Other countries didn't do that. We've got roughly 30 days petroleum products, uh, aviation, diesel, petrol in this country, plus another 30 days on the sea, which in a, in a tense situation may never get to us. Even if, even if it got to us and we put it and we started, started refining it, that's only 60 days total. So uh, uh, we've, we've allowed ourselves uh, to be reduced to uh, two refineries. Those two refineries together produce 10% of the fuel that goes into your car. All the rest of that fuel comes from overseas. Now, we're a nation, we don't have any ships. You know, we've got a slack handful of ships, five or six or something. We don't have any ships. So, so it's not as though, suppose, you know, suppose uh, the tension builds in our area or there was, there was the threat of war or whatever, and the insurance company said, no, we're not insuring any of you tankers going down Osway. Uh, well, what are we going to do? Well, start the clock because in 30 or 60 days' time, we won't have any fuel. So this is why I say we have no resilience and self-reliance. Yes, and isn't one of the first duties of all governments is to ensure that your people are protected? Yes, it is, and, and it's, it's one of the most common, common uh, statements made by all governments to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Now, Jim, going back a little bit, where did you grow up? And what was the inspiration? Was well, mum and dad or anybody involved in the military, uncle and aunties? What, what started the whole career? Well, I, I was born in 1950, so, so as, uh, in, in Melbourne, uh, all, all my, my father and all my uncles went to war. And uh, so, so this is the difference in the generations that we have today. Uh, it was accepted that war, for all its appallingness, was part of life. Uh, and that people had stepped up uh, and they, they'd gone to war and they'd done things and the government haven't had an obligation to do it. I did. I came from, I came from uh, my, my uh, godfather was actually gassed in the First World War. Oh, okay, yep. And I remember my mother taking me down to where he lived in the kind of, in, in a darkened house somewhere in Melbourne, in a Melbourne suburb. And uh I had no comprehension of what was going on, but mum would say, oh, he was gassed in the First World War. You know, uh, we're an extraordinary country. We're a country which, which has benefited from post-enlightenment ideas, countries which have benefited from people's willingness to sacrifice. And I, don't, I, 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 I have a, a great faith in this country that for all the friction that we hear about how bad kids are. The kids we get in the military are first class, absolutely first class. And you don't need, you know, if, if in, in the Second World War, we had to start demobilising soldiers after we went over about 10% of our population because a, a country can only feed itself and, and subsist with about 10% in its military. I, I remember in the 20s how the anti-war feeling in the UK was manifest in its universities. But those same kids still fought in the Second World War. The, the, the risk that we are taking at the moment mm. uh, is, that, is that people will rally. You know, people couldn't care less about Iraq or Afghanistan. I understand that. That's what you've got a regular army for. We'll go and do that. If government got some idea of doing that, we'll go and do that. But for the overall defence of the country, people will rally if the, when the threat is visible to them and they see the threat. Often, though, it could be too late then. Could be too late. And this is the this is what government's got to do. Government has got to prepare itself for the fact that the warning will come very, very late. So it's got to have all the mechanisms in place. You can't build F-35s or buy F-35s 10 days before war occurs or 10 months before war occurs. You've got to have that bloody aircraft now and you've got to have enough 
to do more than one thing in one place at one time. So we're just following the old treaty of appeasement, are we? I am surprised how little we have appeased China. You're surprised? Oh, I'm, I'm very surprised. I thought we'd roll over and ask for China to tickle our tummies. But uh, Morrison's been fabulous on it. You know, the government has stood up and said, okay, we'll keep selling your iron ore, but we'll find other things for our fish and for our barley and for uh, all the other things that you guys have screwed us over. And guess what? We've done it. Is you know, we're flogging business... that stuff in other parts of the world. Well, Jim, is business backing that? Because he's, whilst he's standing up, he's certainly copying it as well, isn't he? Oh, yeah, but you, you'll expect that, won't you, from, uh, from those who over-embrace globalisation. For, and, and it's not business's responsibility at this stage of the game for national security. That's the government's responsibility. And and uh, the government's got a say of business, but I, uh, I couldn't care less if we still import running shoes and thongs and T-shirts from China. I couldn't care less. But the things that we need, IT stuff, generators for our power system, we ought to, be, we ought to start making those ourselves in this country uh, because at a certain stage, there's a fair probability no ships will visit this country. All right. Well, you, yeah, well, I think people are arguing that for a long time, but where's the incentive to do it? Where's the tax breaks to do it? And um, cost of labour is pretty expensive, Jim. Too right, it will be. Yep, too right. It's a good thing we got lots of money, $331 billion we just paid out for uh, COVID. Someone's got lots of money somewhere, Greg. That's true. That's true. I don't know where. I don't know where, but somewhere. So, Jim, might be nice to have your uncles and your families all served. What made you then actually join, go ahead and join, the, and we'll build a career with the Army? Why would you do it? At the age of making that decision was the height of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So, in my last year in school, school uh, I was, say, 67. I joined the Army in 68. Yep. And our troops were deeply involved in combat in in, uh, in Vietnam in that period of time. And uh, my parents were 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 very happy that I went to Duntroon and I, that I uh, that they saw that as something that was was good. Uh, and uh, we've never been short of recruiting people into places like like Duntroon or the Defence Force Academy. Uh, we, we have trouble hanging on to our soldiers after three or six years. Because we ask an awful lot of them, and, and most of them want to, you know, meet a girl and they want to settle down and get married and have kids. And it's an appalling place to have children in the military. I had four of them, and, and uh, the, the, through sheer fluke and my wife's hard work, they seem to have worked out okay. But uh, most 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 young young men and women will give us six or seven years, yep. and that's not bad. Yep. Uh, it's such a young person's game. Mm. You know, if you're going to be a fighter pilot, you, 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 we, we, we don't want you to be a 35, 40-year-old boggy fighter pilot. If you're going to be an infantryman, uh, I, I remember that we bought a, a, a particular, when I was a divisional commander at the age of late 40s, uh, I was commanding 15,000 soldiers, we bought this uh, training mechanism which fired lasers instead of, instead of bullets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought I was pretty fit. And uh, I was pretty fit, actually, but I decided that the, R the regimental sergeant major and I would, would we'd form uh, part of an infantry rifle section. And we were number two and number three on the, on the machine gun. So all we had to do was run along beside the machine gun and hit the ground and then fire our weapons with these laser devices on them. Well, I was stuffed after about five minutes. It was unbelievable. Whereas I could do that for hours when I was a young man. You don't, you know, it, a wastage rate of eight or ten percent is very healthy in the military, and we 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 send about, you know, we lose about seven or eight thousand people per year, and that most of those people make very very good transition, and they have very very good skills. Many of them stay in the reserve, and they're very very valuable to us. So, uh, uh, but in doing that, <clears throat> the government has a particular role, and the government must set in place all of the mechanisms in case we have to start dragging men and women into the military. Jim, did you achieve what you set out to achieve? Uh, I, I don't think I ever set out with a, a big aim. Uh, I, I joined the army and, and spent four years in officer training. I just wanted to pass officer training. I then went up through the ranks and at each rank, 
uh, being in the military requires such an incredible mastery of skills. I haven't seen similar professions elsewhere where you've got to get skills, build on skills, practice skills, not just technical skills, but human skills as well. It really consumes you. Uh, I, I didn't look around at the big world till I was probably a colonel because I was overwhelmed with my responsibilities to my 30 people, then 100 people, and then 700 people, then 3,000 people. Uh, so I don't think I ever set a big aim. But i got to say, I, I've had a great time and I've done amazing things, Greg. I, I cannot, every now, when I, on those occasions when I sit down to think about it, what, what I did in Iraq, what I did in Indonesia, in East Timor, the honour of, of commanding platoon, company, battalion, brigade and division is just beyond belief. So I may not have had a name, but somehow I got here. Well, from what I heard, Jim, and with my phone calls I had pre this um, discussion today, you had a reputation for being pretty tough, pretty hard physically as a sportsman as well. I believe you're a good footballer when you, when you entered the army as well. Yep. And I also understand you're one who really stretched the boundaries. That was your reputation. Um, the other part I understand is um, a man to leave innovation. And you challenged the status quo. I heard there's an interesting story where you, um, the war games, you took uh, some, some men across or the team across to the United States and illustrated to the Americans how, what's, how, what strategy can look like. And was it true that you illustrated with a, an enormous can of Fosters? Was that right, Jim? You put that on the, on the map? I can't, <laughs> Is that I can't remember that. But, <laughs> but uh, I'm prepared to accept that if I have to. But it, it, it was interesting because the exercise you were referring to was called uh, Senior Officers Warfighting Course. And this, this was the course the Americans ran to train their generals how to fight. We have nothing like that in the Australian Army. Nothing at all like that. We might now. We might now. I think things have, things have changed a bit now. We've got some good people going through. But in those days, you know, people still haven't got over bloody Vietnam. And they were still thinking in terms of patrols of 10 people. Right. Uh, but I was, I was fortunate enough over a two-year period to attend a whole bunch of these uh, meetings and then for six weeks to take my, the command elements of the brigade, which was probably eight, 800 people, all, all the commanding officers of the eight battalions plus the communications, logistics battalion, et cetera. And we went across and we, 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 we participated in the best war game the world has ever, has ever, best series of war games the world has ever run. It was set in, in North Korea, uh, set in, 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 in a Korean scenario. It taught me more than I could ever imagine about being a war fighting general. And uh, so when I went to Iraq, I knew how the Americans fought. I knew what their equipment was like. I knew many of the generals who were involved, and that's what says how you should be preparing your people. And you're a chief of operations in Iraq, were you not? I was. I was the chief of operations for the multinational force in Iraq, which was uh, about 150,000 Americans, 25,000 Europeans, yep. uh, or, or people from other, uh, uh, other countries, not Iraq, and then about 125,000, 130,000 Iraqis. So I, I ran all of the military operations for that incredible force out of an American headquarters, uh, which was a, a, an extraordinary culmination of, of, of a military career. It showed me that to live and work in the belly of the beast, the Americans. Yep. Yeah, a, a lot of people think that American military power is, is infinite. Yes. And it's far from being infinite. And the Americans uh, used to used to finance their military and man at their military and equip their military to be able to win two major wars, one in Europe, one in the Middle East, for example, and then a minor war in, the, uh, in South America, for example. This was called the two and a half war strategy. Okay. But since the end of the Cold War, since 1991, they have reduced their military to uh, being able to uh, perhaps uh, uh, conduct one major war, they're not confident about it, conduct one major war and hold in another war. Now that is a 30 to 50% decrease in the American military capability. Now that should frighten the living bejesus out of Australia, but it doesn't. It has no impact in, in, in Australia. No one's running around saying, bloody hell, 
You know, we must make up the difference. And in, in actual fact, it should be a real warning to us because what we're seeing at the moment is the potential for two major wars, one from Russia into, into, the, into Ukraine and one from uh, China into Taiwan. Yep. The one in China is much more dangerous uh, for the world and for Australia. So uh, it, 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 I don't think America will ever go back to what they were doing before. Why should they? Mm. They carried the world for 75 years and the world didn't thank them. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I just have not been in spot. So, you know, the military has gone down somewhat mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's still a fabulous military, but it's not the military it was. And I'm not overly impressed with U.S. leadership. You know, in both the Trump and the and the Biden periods of time, you've served, Jim. You've served throughout your life. What is service? In in my case, it comes from a realization that what Australia is is something worth preserving. Uh, Australia is an extraordinary country, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll hear all the friction from various groups about what a terrible place it is and how badly people are being treated. But more people, you know, it, when I, when I look at my children. They have done magnificently. I have not made big money in my life. I've made, I've made good money, but my children are privileged. If you are not privileged, you've got a greater chance of doing well in this country than any other country in the world. And that's what's something that, that's through service we should maintain. And, and uh, I, 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 I'm very comfortable in kind of working in the areas that I work in because it, it, it's, like, it's like the priesthood. You, you, you've got a, a higher motivation uh, than just being a public servant or just being a businessman or whatever. Uh, I'll never make vast amounts of money, but uh, I will have vast amounts of satisfaction, I hope, at the end of my life. Uh, and with a bit of luck, I will have contributed to the continuation of this extraordinary country. And Jim, I'll be silly not to ask you, based on your career, for our audience out there, something in the order around leadership and actually what is leadership and how does one motivate people to follow someone like yourself? I've never been very good at defining what leadership is, but I've always been required to do it and to show it. Yeah. When I first went to the St. James Ethics Centre, which is a magnificent organisation, made me think about ethics in a way that I had never thought about them before. We, we in the military have ethics uh, drilled into us, and I, I, I just accept the drilling. I hadn't thought them through until I, I had five years as the director of the St. James Ethics Centre. Um, and I started to think about them then. And uh, I was also invited to the uh, our, our staff college after I came back from Iraq to lecture on the subject of, of war fighting, of, of, of uh, what we call generalship, which is not what generals do in the bureaucracy, but generalship is what they do on the battlefield. Right. And I came up with, with, with 12 requirements, which I'll, I'll send you a copy of them if you want to put them on your website. Okay. But the first one really was competence. The first one was that you've got to know what you're doing. You know, I don't care whether you are the strangest person in the world and you can't talk to human beings because we'll, we'll put someone standing next to you who can do that. <laughs> but if you can win battles and win wars... Oh wow! Well, you know you are worth your weight in gold, and uh, there are different there are different forms of leadership, and those who are running the show have got to construct the right form of leadership around the right leader. But le leadership is about decision making, and and I've always run the, the the philosophy that that as a general, I could probably make most decisions I could make, and I, I would be making, you know, in, in Iraq and in other operational situations, I would be making five or six or seven significant life and death decisions per day. Yep. I could get most of those 85% correct. And just, just because, because I'm the boss and I've got more experience than anyone else. But to get from 85 to 100, yep. I needed the people around me to be a, a, a really close team. And also a big responsibility of that team is to make sure that I didn't go off at a 180 degree tangent. And I've, done, I've tried to do that on one or two occasions. And the, and the boys and girls say, bloody hell, sir, don't do that. Whatever leadership is, there is a lot of energy in leadership. And, and I've always had uh, much more energy than most people around me. 
and that enabled me in Iraq to, to work 16, 20 hours a day for 365 days a year, seven days a week, yep. uh, and to still be functional at the end of it. And, and people fed off the, the energy that I had. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, you go back to competence uh, and, and uh, I, I do think that is just so important. You go back through the number of military leaders that you can think of who were assholes, uh, but they tended to be able to win wars. Yeah. Well, don't boot them out because they, 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 they weren't socially acceptable. Put, you know, two people who could... I, there was, there was a, a very famous American general who visited me when I was a brigade commander in Darwin, and he was a four-star American general, and uh, I fell foul of him because I gave him a briefing on my brigade which didn't suit his needs. Oh. So he walked out on me. Okay, well, fair enough. He was a, he was he commanded three hundred and fifty thousand troops. I commanded about three thousand five hundred troops. <laughs> he had this marine colonel whose job it was to walk around after him and apologise to people. Now that's that's a, you know <laughs> if he's a, if he's a good warrior, then you know you put a colonel behind him to apologise to people and, and let him win the war. So, so uh, I, I don't I don't know whether I can explain it much, much more than that. Empathy is very, very important. You've got to be empathetic, and understand what what your people are feeling and how they're feeling. Uh, and, and then we in the military, we have a particular quirk, which is if the mission is more important than the people, you've got a real leadership problem on your hand because you expect your people to die for the mission. Uh, we've been to war now for year after year after year where quite often the people were more important than the mission. And one day the Australian people will look at us and they'll say, well, it's finally come. We've been paying you $45 billion per year for about 100 years. Now we'd like you to go out there and defend, you, defend us all. And that probably involves a lot of people dying. And, and uh, that's a different, totally different form of leadership at each and every level. Jim, you the other part is what you've got the reputation for is being a thinker. Do you, people in your, in your experience, do people think enough and from how you do it, how do you do it, Jim? And where do you do it? And where do you make the time to do it? Well, I, I don't know whether I make the time to do it very well. All I do is, is work. I don't do anything but work, uh, but I do enjoy my work. So my work is my hobby and, and I guess that's good. Uh, in the military, we have a we have a particular form of intuitive decision making in the military. It's been hard to carry it over mm -hmm. because I'm not a I'm not a, a, a decision maker in in the parliament in any way shape or form. Yep. But my own personal decisions are still impacted by that process, and it's an intuitive decision making process where whereby an individual with experience can make intuitive decisions. And if you are surrounded by a staff as you are in the military. Yep. And you you have the kind of you have the character whereby you accept that the, the troops can say to you, "Don't do that, boss. You've done that three times already, and it's stuffed up. If you do it again, it'll be a disaster." If you're big enough to to accept that, and and most modern generals are, most of us rely on on the the the, the fact that all of us make a much better decision than one or two of us. You don't want to you don't want to make st start from nothing because yep. most of us know a lot about something. Yeah. And, and but right at the end of that decision making process is is where you pull your staff in, and we call it an intuitive decision making process. Uh, how much I think I, I do think a lot. I think a lot about national security at the moment. I'm arrogant enough to say that I'm probably thinking more about national security mm -hmm. in its broadest sense across the entire country and the military than anyone else in this country, which is what's driven me to write that uh, write that book. What's the What's the book called, Jim? The book, the book is called uh, Danger on Our Doorstep. It's, it will be published by HarperCollins in the next few months. Okay. And it will run the argument that I think we're preparing for the wrong war. Okay. All right. I'm looking forward to that. Now, Jim, this is a more of an open question, I guess, based on your experience and what you've achieved. You know, so I'm sure people are going to stand back and say, and this is a really simple question, why would talented Australians want to go into politics you didn't walk into politics you had to fight your way in to get in 
Now look at look at the pedigree of yourself. Look what you've achieved. Is it all too difficult? Uh, it is very very difficult to achieve anything, and I'm going in, into politics at the wrong end of my life. Of course, y y it is far far better to have had some life experience before you go into politics. Yep. Uh, many many of our people don't, but some who don't do very very well anyhow. I, I'm going into politics because. By the time I started looking at the political system, I used to shake my head in absolute astonishment yeah. and say, who's running the bloody show? Yeah. You know, why do we make such a decision? And within the military, we are encouraged very much to criticise ourselves, but I didn't see too much criticism of the political system. And until you understand the political system, it's very hard to criticise. It was very, very interesting. I went for a pre-selection mm in the Liberal Party in New South Wales. And that pre-selection was about 100 people and there were three or four or five or six of us going for a Senate position. That pre-selection was the most disgustingly corrupt process I have ever laid eyes on. I'd just come back from the Middle East killing people who were anti-democracy. Anti yep. And now I subject myself in, in all honesty, I, my wife and I worked extraordinarily hard. We visited just about every one of those 100 people physically and spoke politics with them. Mm -hmm. And it's totally irrelevant. It was rigged. It was re-rigged. Yeah. It was rigged again. Yep. And they got the result that they wanted at the end of the day. Then they reversed the results at the end of the day. Yep. So I thought to myself, well, this is interesting. So so I then I was then cajoled into joining, joining the uh, uh, Democratic Reform Movement. Yep. And for two years with guys like Tony Abbott, Walter Villatora, and, and a number of people who've been working for democracy within our party at the, at the bottom level, uh, uh, we, we ran a two-year campaign on top of an eight-year campaign, and we finally got a significant amount of democracy. We got plebiscites in the lower house seats and, and various other things. Uh, 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 so that was worth doing, and that was an education in itself. And I do like and I do have a degree of respect for my colleagues. Uh, the, the factional system within within parties is, you've just got to accept that. It doesn't carry across very much into our colleagues. Within the elected colleagues, within the parliament, uh, we, you can work, generally work with all the factions within left, centre, right in the, in the past. Yeah, the question is, but are we getting the best talent through, Jim, as a result of what you've seen? I don't think, I, I look at some of my colleagues and I say, you are something else. You are fantastic. Most of us are just pretty ordinary people. And and uh, a, a lot of the voters will vote for pretty ordinary people because they identify with them. But it, it really helps if you've done something before you come into politics, I think. But, you know, I spent a year and a half in politics then I was so naive, my government, my own party booted me out for five months. That's right. And I learned... I learned an awful lot in that, and uh, I then I then ran below the line yeah. for the Senate and, and uh, didn't get enough votes to get back in. But as I said before, I got more votes than any politician in Australian federal or state political history has ever gotten. That blew me away. So I thought, I'll go for this. Then Arthur Sinodinus decided to go to America, yep. and I ran for pre-selection again and, and did very, very well in that pre-selection because I was supported by very good people and I'd learned uh, at how to run, how to do a pre-selection. So, being being a senator, is it fulfilling? There, there, there is nothing much fulfilling about it. Uh, being a backbench senator is a pain in the neck. Yes. Being on committees is unbelievable amount of work. It's not as though I get to look forward to being a minister because I won't ever be a minister. But this is so important, Greg. It is so overwhelmingly important. And I'm just learning how to do it now. I'm just learning how to be effective in politics after four years. Uh, uh, and and I want to I want to make that uh, I want to continue to do that for a while. And Senator Molan, if you were to look back at that young that young Jim going into Duntroon, what advice would you give him today? Gee, um, I, I'd say work very very hard. Be as confident as you can and make the best of each break because getting on will be very, very determined by luck. Luck plays an incredible part. 
the harder you work, the smarter you are, the more lucky you are, but luck can still blow us all away. When I think of some of the errors that I made as a young officer and which were never discovered, Greg, uh, I, I think, wow, that was lucky. And so I could have been blown away. At a very, if I'd been playing football and smashed my knee, yep. I could never have gone this far. So I was very, very lucky. Well, Senator Mullen, thank you very, very much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I do wish you all the very best in the, on that new book. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to go there and buy it as fast as they can. Thanks, Greg. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to No Limitations. Mm -hmm.